Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Quagliata, and I'm a lecturer here in the Hotel School. Welcome. It's my pleasure, actually, to have you all here for this final round of judging of the ninth annual Cornell Hospitality Business Plan Competition. The competition is one of the highlight events of both HEC and the programming that the Pillsbury Institute carries on throughout the year. Through more than a dozen programs with entrepreneurs and residents, opportunities to engage with alumni, and also the Hospitality Pitch Deck Competition. Neil Trollo uh, is our director of the Pillsbury Institute, and he regrets that he, he couldn't be here today. He had to travel uh, out of town on family matters. For those of you who are new to the competition, it begins in the fall when teams submit an executive summary of their plan. This group was narrowed to a, a group of semi-finalist teams who submitted a full business plan. The five finalist teams presenting today were selected from that group by a panel of judges. We want to thank our semi-final judges, some of whom are present here today. Kenny Blatt, Yaniv Blum Blumenfeld, Diana Dobin, Michael Frankel, Stephen Horowitz, Ravi Marotra, Allison Page, Richie Petrina, Fred Singer, Stephen Theodoropoulos, Jacob Wright, and Ellen Yui. Today, the teams are competing for the first place prize of $25,000. Second place will receive $7,500, and third place will receive $5,000. These generous awards were made possible by our sponsors, including Sandy Solomon from Sweet Street Desserts, Stanley Sun, Bob Alter Family, the Shingleton family, including Elizabeth Shingleton Glomsrud and Barbara Foote Shingleton, and Chuck Delorier. Now to get the competition started, first let me introduce our panel of judges here in the front row. We've got Sandy Solomon, founder and CEO of Sweet Street Desserts. Thank you, Sandy. Chuck Delorier, president of Delorier and Company. Thank you, Chuck. And Ellen Yui, principal of Yui and Company and Yui Design. Thank you, Ellen. A few logistics. Each team will give a 10-minute presentation for the audience, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A from the judges. Now let's get started. Our first team is Entroterra. Uh, the team members, Gemma Richardson, Nicole Kuzenza, and Ash Anushe Foresta. Please welcome them to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gemma Galucho Richardson, and we are Entroterra. So I grew up traveling between Italy and the US. And when I traveled to Italy, I would spend time with my grandmother on the coast. But she would take me sometimes inland. In Italian, inland is entroterra. And we would spend a couple days on a farm. These farms are called agriturismi, or agritourisms. And what we would do is be hosted by a couple farmers. Can you help me with this mic? Thank you. OK, so we would spend the weekend often hosted by these, farm, by these farmers in their own homes. And in the morning, I would spend times in the terrace gardens. We would weed, pick uh, the vegetables, fresh tomatoes, use them later in the day. We'd then go out on horseback, explore the countryside and then come back and help them cook their regional cuisine with their added value products. Most importantly, we would share a meal together. It was these experiences in my childhood that made me feel more connected to my heritage. More importantly, they made me feel more connected to the land. Back in America, when I would go visit my grandparents on their family farm in South Dakota, the farming landscape was very different. These were older folks with their uh, children these younger generations were trying to get out of the business. It wasn't working for them. Making farm production just wasn't enough. There was a stark contrast in my mind, which made me think, could the concept of an agritourism from Italy be translated into the United States to help the farmers of today? So I came to Cornell with this vision, but I needed some grounding. 
So what did I do? I looked at my classmates, I tried to find the savviest ones out there, and I found Anushe, who's got a background in finance and experience with her own entrepreneurial startup, and then Nicole, with a background in product development and scaling startups. And more importantly, they believed in the vision. So we needed to get this project going, but we couldn't do it without farmers. We had to understand what their needs were. We're in Ithaca right now, so what did we do? We traveled around the Finger Lakes, all around the Hudson Valley, Adirondacks, even across Lake Champlain to Vermont. Across the board, small-scale family farms were struggling to keep their businesses. Farm production wasn't enough, and added value products weren't cutting it. They, were, they realized that they needed to diversify their revenue streams, and they were interested in agritourism. Some people even invested in putting up cabins and then putting it up on Airbnb. But they realized it wasn't enough. There was too much time involved, capital. Most importantly from our interviews, we understood they didn't have a hospitality background. Okay, Gemma, it's great that the farms are on board, but what about our customer market, the people who are actually going to be paying us money for this product? Well, as it turns out, most of us have probably participated in agritourism activities at some point in our lives. We've all been apple picking, we've all been to a pumpkin patch, and all of these activities fall under the USDA Census of Agriculture's definition of agritourism, which most recently was a $700 million industry. So how do we further segment this wide market? Well, we went out and we spoke with about 150 agritourism customers over the past nine months. And we spoke with people in rural environments, such as the Cider House in Ithaca, as well as more urban environments, such as the Farmer's Market in New York City. And what we found is there are two key market demographics that we should focus on. There's an older generation of empty nesters. So these are people who potentially had an agricultural childhood and are seeking these experiences out because they want to relive the small, tangible wins that they had during their youth. Further, there are young, affluent families coming from urban environments who have children or teenagers that they want to teach the concept of responsibilities that can be found in an agricultural setting. For example, we spoke with a physician who brought his family to the same farm every single year so that he could teach his children these small, tangible wins such as going out to the chicken coop in the morning and collecting eggs for breakfast. So how is this need currently being satisfied in the marketplace? Well, there are a lot of agritourism players out there, but we found that they're really just taking small bits and pieces of the agritourism dream that we have. So there's often a trade-off between a focus on high-end amenities and curated programming experiences. So on one end of the spectrum, we have luxury players or glamping concepts. Their programming revolves around expensive culinary or wine tastings. While on the other end of the spectrum, we have the more mass market you-pick farms. Airbnb, as Gemma mentioned earlier, can really span this spectrum. There are farm hosts who are trying to be involved in their guests' day-to-day -day and hosting small-scale activities, and then there are hosts that really want nothing to do with their guests. But the commonality is they don't have a hospitality background. So where Enchotero wants to come in and disrupt is by focusing on curated programming that's further tied to a social mission. So we want to make highly visible to our guests the positive impact that they're having on their local agricultural economy by as much face time with their farmers as possible. And doing this at a mid-scale reasonable price point that can accommodate comfortable amenities. So how can we bring this product to life where it satisfies the needs of the farmers as well as our guests? Well, we can look at a case study of two of our pilot programs going on with farms we've identified in New York and Vermont. Typically what we'll do is go out and speak with potential farm partners. They may already have small-scale agritourism operations running, or they haven't really had the time to get involved in it yet, but it's something that's been on their horizon. We would rent their land, a parcel of their land, for dollars per month. And the type of programming that we could offer would be dictated by the types of resources that they have available. On the guest side of things, it's pretty straightforward. Our guests would pay a nightly rate for your accommodations, and they would take part in programming, culinary, outdoor, and farm, along the lines of what the region would have available. So imagine you've had a long week in New York, and you can't wait to get out of the city with your family. You arrive at Entroterra at night, and we take you to a yurt. Now, a yurt is better than a tent. It's got walls, structured walls, enclosed dome. It has a collapsible framework, so it's mobile, a little bit more comfortable than your popular glamping site. In the morning, 
I'll take your kids and I'll teach them how to milk a goat, have some fresh goat milk. We'll then go and meet the farmer. We'll go into the fields, help him with whatever low impact help he needs, usually weeding. Um, and then harvest some fresh produce that we'll use later that day. You'll then come back with me. I'll teach you everything I know, make you fresh pasta and convert that fresh goat milk into goat cheese, just like the one on your plates. So how do we solve this real problem for our real farmers, be, bridge the gap in the market, but yet still be financially sound? To convert Entroterra into a reality, our startup costs are looking at around $105,000, out of which we are hoping 24% to be contributed by this business plan competition. <laughs> so what does the $105,000 include? Our major cost contributors are the yurts and the portable washrooms. As our customers are paying for this comfortable experience, we need to ensure we have enough infrastructure and are not reliant on these farms. In addition, we have included our pilot program's operating expenses in our startup costs so that we're not strapped for cash and not reliant on these revenues. Our model is priced at $375 per night, including all the food expenses, as well as in, after being established for two years, we do hope to increase our occupancy to 60% from 50% as projected in year one. Our cost of goods sold will be co contributed by farm takeover fees, food expenses, and yurt expenses. So what does our pilot program look like? In our first pilot program, we'll be operational for five months. Our first two farms will be the ones that we've identified before, one in New York, the other one in Vermont. As you can see, the first year, there's a tiny line of net profit, which basically means that we break even in our first year. In our second year, we will move from a five-month to a 10-month model, moving from the Northeast to the Southeast. And then in the third year, within the 10-month model, we will also be going to California Hub. In these three hubs, we will be still keeping the three-year model and we will be mobile throughout those 10 months. As you can see, in year two and year three, we're increasing our revenues. In year two, we increase our revenues by increasing our operational months. And in year three, we increase our revenues by increasing our occupancy, hoping to increase it to 60%. Future looking, seeing the success of these three years, we do believe that we can be set up in different farms at the same time, taking advantage of higher revenues. With a great management team and a strong advisory board, we truly believe we can make Entroterra into a reality. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that great presentation. Uh, the question I have, I have actually two questions. One is uh, hiring that person, that on-site person, uh, is going to be critical to your success. And, uh, and so what is the process that you're going to use for interviewing that person and finding the right individual? Will there be one person uh, for each location? Thank you. I can answer that. So in the first year, it would be me. And uh, I've been talking with farmers, so it really becomes a matter of creating a, a stable relationship with them. In, their, in the second year, because we're going to be uh, long, working for longer months uh, and then traveling, we're going to add on part-time work. Um, this person can be like me. It can be someone who is, has a culinary background and a hospitality background. The possibility could even extend to an actual member from that family if they're in, really interested in learning the hospitality background and the know-how to kind of understand that value proposition. Moving on, were we to scale? Uh, we were considering the idea of bringing on, bringing full-time, basically those part-time members would be eligible to then be full-time operators. And if they wanted to kind of have it at their own farm or do have it at a per particular location, they would actually, we would ask them, it would be like an operating partner agreement um, where they would put a little bit of money in, so they have some skin in the game as well, given that we've put our own money in as well. And um, if they reach a baseline profit margin, they would then be incentivized by uh, like 5%. They would in be kind of eligible for 5% of the profit, so it incentivizes them to do well as well. So that's, that would be it. 
The second question I had for you is, uh, uh, this concept is not that well known. It's more common in Italy. Can you just comment on the steps that you would take to market uh, your service? Yeah, I can answer that. So um, yeah, you're very right. So as you could tell by Gemma's sort of Italian introduction to the concept, it's very popular in Europe. Um, and what the key thing for us when we open in a new market, as we mentioned, we're looking to expand to these different agricultural hubs, will be establishing ties with the community. And the reason we're prioritizing that is because that's how we were successfully able to um, you know, convince these two partnering farms to work with us. So whether that involves you know, FaceTime in, in the community in terms of going to um, local farmers markets or um, contacting local newsletters. The, the advertising in the go-to-market strategy is, is very specific to the region that we're, um, that we're hoping to open in. Uh, hey, uh, wonderful the way you're connecting um, two markets um, in need of, of experience and uh, financial um, remuneration. You know, the farmers are suffering right now. But um, one of the things that I have noticed due to some experience, I'll, you know, I'll start beating around. There are, you did not um, talk about the vast array of competitors. You picked on two uh, very successful uh, companies who own and run their, their um, facilities, you know, their farm to table. And there had, there has been some attempt to do this same market, um, the European market, by a company um, out of Europe. And uh, they came here and they put yurts on many properties and the farmers didn't stay focused on it. Mm, yeah. You know, you hit on it, there wasn't hospitality uh, in their blood and they had to work. So. Um, have you looked at those kinds of competitors and looked at Firelight's experience mm -hmm. and thought about how you can make that difference? Yeah, I think one of the key things that we're trying to tie into this is mm -hmm. the social mission aspect of the programming. So one of the things we noticed just from speaking with customers is it's one thing to be sort of placed on a farm and kind of be, be set in that environment, but there's the whole educational aspect of it and there's the whole um, you know, feeling like you're directly having a positive impact on the community that you're working in. Um, so I think in terms of how we want to differentiate from people who've tried this sort of mobile asset light business before where they've you know, placed lodging units on farms is by making it more tailored to the specific region that we're operating in. So even, you know, you asked about the go-to market strategy before, we want to be able to, for example, present bios of the specific farmers that um, the guests will be working with and understanding, you know, their background and how um, the production of the farm ties in. So we want to sort of better incorporate the educational, um, making something with your hands, tangible aspect of the experience. And just in terms of having the farmers really buy in and believe this, uh, I was recently at an agriculinary tourism conference in Ithaca, and I spoke to 50 farmers. I have 10 people who want to work with us. There are people who, it is a matter of just, we're, they're basically, their risk that they're taking is, is based on the volume of sales that we make. So we're giving 25% of our revenues to them. They're incentivized to do well, and uh, the percentage could change based on how much or how little they want to be involved, but, there's a real interest um, to make, I guess, pe more people want to come and stay on farms, um, and they just don't have the time or they don't understand the strategy. So it's a one cl clarification: yes. is it 375? Whether it's four people, it's just per yurt. Per yurt, we're assuming. Uh, for example, if it, if it's a family, the yurt is 115 square feet could fit comfortably a queen bed and uh, a pull-out couch or a bunk bed for kids. So beyond force of your personality, how do you pass this on and broaden the market? Uh, I guess related to the first question, mm -hmm. we really have to be a managing partner. You have to have worked with us. Um, you have to buy in as well. So 
Uh, it would really require to working a season before taking this on. And you know, there's, I mean, we can bring on people who have this hospitality culinary background, but the reality is there's about to be a massive generational shift in terms of farmland being inherited. And this younger generation is more aware of the benefits of participating in agritourism. Um, so if it's something that if we position it correctly now, we can leverage that you know, future talent coming up to be able to, to take on this managing partner role. Uh, uh, hi. Hi, hi Gemma. Hi. Um, uh, great job. Uh, I would like to go if I could convince my husband to stay in a yurt, which is highly <laughs> unlikely. Um, I would. He can design them, maybe? Yeah. Uh, a couple, uh, uh, one observation, I guess, and, and I don't know if you want to expound on this, is, is in your plan, in my mind, there was a little confusion over your core mission. Um, you, the social mission, I do think, would be a big draw for families, and it would give you the opportunity to extend and continue to build a relationship. So one question on that, what is your plan for repeat customers? Sorry. For what is your plan for, for repeat customers? Who oh, primarily for repeat be customers. Um, so, I mean, we're really capitalizing on the fact that we're targeting people who are in a pretty close vicinity to um, the agritourism that they would be staying in. So we can kind of go back to some of the customers we spoke to who did bring their families repeatedly to the same farm. And the fact that they had face time with these farmers throughout the experience um, is something that you know, was able to draw repeat customers just because they actually built those relationships. Um, when you have kids, and you know you have a family, you want to just be able to plan something easily where you know that your kids had a good time um, and there was something for every person in the family to do. But even as we kind of expand our brand name and expand globally, um, you know we do hope to be able to see if we're able to expand that marketing strategy to having people chase this agritourism and Terra brand um, across the United States as well. And not only that, the seasons. We benefit from the seasons. So you could come back in June, have an activity, and in September, something else. And have different else. programming activities, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.